Well, good morning and welcome to this morning's broadcast. If you're joining us for the very first time, a really warm welcome to you. I'm Jonathan and I'm a senior minister here at Woodford Baptist Church. And I'm filming from within the building. We're getting things ready for returning into the building from next week. Our hope and our prayer is that we'll be live streaming from within the building. And a little bit more news about that later on, how you might be able to join us if that is uh, possible. Um, so I want to share that a bit later. But for now, I want to welcome you. And uh, whether you've been with us every week of lockdown or a few times or this is the first time, or whatever it is, you are so... Uh, so welcome to join us today and we're so glad that you're joining us for this act of worship here online. As we've been going through lockdown we have been lighting a candle together at the start of our time, an action that we've been doing in each of our own homes or wherever it is that we find ourselves. So I want to give you a moment just to find that candle um, and we'll light them together. And there's nothing you know mystical about the candle in that sense, it's still just a candle. Um, but uh, when we take these candles and we light them together, we're bringing light into our homes and we're reminding ourselves of things. We're reminding ourselves that we have brothers and sisters in this area, but across the nations who are joining with us right now in doing this exact same act. They're lighting their candles and uh, we're reminding ourselves that the light of Christ shines on us wherever we are. That whatever's going on in our lives right now, God's light can come into the midst of it. So hopefully you have your candle and uh, we're gonna, we are gonna light them together now. So as we have lit our candles, let's pray. Father, thank you for that truth that whatever we're going through right now, your light can shine in the darkness and I pray that you would bring illumination to us and in our homes and wherever we find ourselves now wherever in the world we find ourselves now that your light would come into our situations into our lives into our hearts bringing peace and hope and illumination of anything that we are struggling with now so bless us and bless this time now we pray in Jesus name Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible handy, I want to encourage you to grab a Bible. And uh, we're going to look at a psalm together, just the beginning of a psalm, the beginning of Psalm 33. And uh, the beginning of Psalm 33, the psalmist writes, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. What a picture that the earth is full of God's unfailing love. His love never fails us. He watches over us as a father. Let's come to him in worship and in praise now as we sing. Chosen me, 
says you have broken every curse Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free Lord, I can help but sing be on my lips ever be 
lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, your kindness makes us whole. Shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame, and known by her true name. That's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Makes us whole, and you shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame. That's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Father, we worship you. You are so good to us. And be with us now as we continue to focus on you and draw close to you and seek to know your presence with us. Amen. Amen. I want to read to you from uh, this great Children of God uh, Bible that we've been reading together over lockdown. This is the story of Esther. Esther saves her people. It's a wonderful picture that goes with this story. After many years, the land of Israel was conquered and the Jewish people were taken to live in Persia. One of the Jewish girls was named Esther and as she grew up, the king of Persia chose her to be his wife. But no one knew, not even the king, that she was Jewish, a descendant 
of the ancient Hebrews. Haman, one of the king's advisers, did not like the Jews and told the king that they should be killed. Queen Esther's cousin Mordecai came to the palace to tell her about Haman's plan. Please, beg the king not to kill our people, he, played, he pleaded. Esther paced back and forth, trembling with fear. Anyone who goes to the king without being called will be killed. God has chosen you, Esther. You are our only hope, Mordecai said and left. Esther prayed for courage. And then she went to the king and begged, Please, save me and my people. Who wants to harm you? said the king. Wicked Haman, she said, pointing at him. The king was furious and ordered that Haman be killed. Oh. Esther's courage to confront the king saved the Jews, who were filled with great joy and celebrated with a feast to thank God for his protection. Dear God, help me to protect my community. Amen. And we want to be people who look after everybody in our community, don't we? And make sure that nobody mistreats people or tries to harm people. And so we want to be the kind of people who God can use in our communities to bring peace. So I pray that you will be too. Um, we now have some prayers and Jenny's going to lead us in a time of prayer. So thank you, Jenny. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we want to pray for so many different situations that impact on us, but also impact on our world. And we know that only through you and by you things can change. And that's why this morning, Lord, we come to you with our prayers, with our requests, in faith, believing that you can move mountains. And Lord, we pray this morning for our country, for the decisions our government needs to make at this time. We continue to pray for wisdom and for clarity, Lord. We also want to pray for the world, especially those countries who have been terribly impacted, affected by the pandemic, not just health-wise, but also financially. And Lord, there's so many people suffering. And we come to you, Lord, knowing that you are all-powerful and that you can change situations. Lord, we also want to bring to you this morning people who have been on holiday abroad, particularly in France, and who might find themselves stranded at this time. We pray for peace. Lord, we want to pray for the children and parents as they prepare to start school again. We pray for protection. We pray for a sense of your presence in the schools and in the hearts of our children. We also pray for our friends and family who are unwell at this time. We pray for healing and restoration in Jesus' name. And we can think of a couple of people in our own church family who need a special touch from you this morning. And we pray that your healing power will touch their bodies in the name of Jesus. Even now as we pray. And Lord, we continue to pray for Beirut after the impact of the explosion on the 4th of August. We pray for healing and restoration to come into that country. So much devastation. Sometimes the words are not enough to really express or to even know what to say in a situation like this. But Lord, you know each and every person who has been impacted. You know what they need. Oh Lord, we just pray your miraculous intervention in that country. We pray for, for integrity in the government. And we pray for the world to come together and support at least required. And I'm just reminded of Psalm 102 where it says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, 
Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. Amen and amen. Just a couple of pieces of family news before we jump into the scripture together. I mentioned right at the beginning about us moving back into the building next week and it'll be a communion service. So if you are able to join us, and I'll explain that in just a moment, there will be something provided here for communion. But if you're watching at home, you'll need to be prepared to share communion at home again, as we have been doing um, during lockdown on our live streams. We are welcoming uh, a small number of people into the building for the recording of the live stream and to be there while we're, we're broadcasting from the church. Primarily, we want to invite people who have struggled during lockdown to access um, any fellowship or have struggled with accessing the live stream. Some of those people will be reaching out to directly, but it may be that you would like to ask for some tickets. We're releasing the tickets in two week batches at a time. And we'd encourage you not just to get a ticket for everyone that you can when they come up, but instead to make sure that others get a chance. And so um, those tickets will be available from our Facebook page. You can find a link there and that is facebook.com forward slash Woodford Baptist Church forward slash events. And you'll see there two events listed, socially distanced church for the two dates that we have, as well as an event called Digging Deeper. Um, and you can apply for tickets for uh, all of those from that same page, Woodford, sorry, um, facebook.com forward slash Woodford Baptist forward slash events. And there's thunder and lightning going outside as we're recording this. So uh, if you hear that off, uh, off in the distance, that's what's happening here. So um, if you want to sign up for those things and come along, then there will be some seats. It may be that by now those seats are all taken, in which case the next set of two weeks will be coming soon and hopefully you'll be able to get one of those. If you've been trying for a number of weeks to get tickets um, and you're not able to, then please do email me at hello at woodfordbaptist.org. That's hello at woodfordbaptist.org. And uh, we'll see, you know, if somebody's managed to get four weeks in a row, then we might just say to that person, well, actually, can you not? We're also holding some seats back for people that we know have struggled, as well as a few seats for people who might just be walking past who don't know our church and want to join us on the day. So let us know if you're struggling to join us and you'd like to, because it may well be that we can do something about that. And then the other thing that's there is called Digging Deeper. This is the course that we've mentioned for the last couple of weeks. Michael Snelling, who's part of the church family here, uh, previously a missionary and a teacher in a Bible college in Colombia. Um, we're so grateful to him for teaching a six week course for us, which is all about uh, unearthing the timeless wisdom that is in the scripture and helping us to engage with that uh, in this rapidly changing culture that we live in. That's called Digging Deeper. And it starts in a couple of weeks time on Saturday, the, sorry, not Saturday, forget that, Sunday, Sunday the 13th of September seven o'clock in the evening and it's on zoom it's entirely on zoom so the whole thing will be online but we need you to register for that so we can give you the access to zoom and include you in the right groups for discussion and that kind of a thing so please do sign up for that as well again that is facebook.com forward slash Woodford Baptist forward slash events um, give you a moment just to grab your bible and I shall do the same So today we're going to be reading Ezra chapter 2. So you want to find Ezra in your Bible. And we're going to be thinking today a little bit about people and people in Ezra chapter 2. It follows on chapter 1. And in chapter 1, Cyrus has issued a decree to say that Israel should be rebuilt following this long period of exile where the people of Israel have been out of that land and uh, uh, now they should go back and start to rebuild, is the king's decree. Here we get to chapter 2 then, and it's a chapter that's all about people. Now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to their own town, in company with Zerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpah, Bigvi, Rahum, and Banah. The list of the men of the people of Israel, the descendants of Parosh, 
2172 of Sheftaya 372 of Ara 775 of Pahath Moab through the line of Jeshua and Joab 2812 and I won't read the rest other than just to have a look at the lists there were the men of Bethlehem there were in verse 36 the priests in verse 40 the Levites and then the musicians the gatekeepers the temple servants the descendants of the servants of Solomon and then I want us to read from verse uh, 59 the following came up from the towns of Tel Melah, Tel Harsha, Kerub, Adon, and Imma, but they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. The descendants of Delia, Tobiah, and Nakoda, 652. And from among the priests, the descendants of Hobiah, Hakoz, and Barzillai, a man who had married a daughter of Barzillai the Gileadite, and was called by that name. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there was a priest ministering with the Urim and Thummim. The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 male and female slaves. They also had 200 male and female singers. They had 376 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. And when they returned to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave freewill offerings toward the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for this work 61,000 darics of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. The priests, the Levites, and the musicians, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants settled in their own towns, along with some of the other people, and the rest of the Israelites settled in their towns. Wow. Lots of numbers. You can read them later, and you can pick through them, and see if there's any of the names that you recognize, or uh, find some of their stories it's a really worthwhile thing to do that's not what I wanted us to do today particularly I want us just to pause and just to take a look at this list and to see some of the things that we see in there partly because I think it might be helpful to us as we're getting our, our heads around what it means to return uh, Ezra is a great book for us to be looking at because it deals with this season in the history of the nation of Israel when they've been out of the promised land uh, for them, it was issues of sin that caused uh, God's protection to lift from them. Nebuchadnezzar came, took them, brought them to Babylon where they were uh, in exile. And many of them lived basically as enslaved people, but many of them lived free. And uh, many of them lived free for generations and generations. Nebuchadnezzar's plan was that they would become citizens of uh, his kingdom and he would add to his kingdom their strength and their numbers. So Nebuchadnezzar is long gone, Cyrus has issued his declaration that it's time for Israel to be rebuilt, the temple's not there, the land lies in ruins, we get that as we read Nehemiah, who's name-checked in the early verses of chapter 2 of Ezra as one of those that's returning at this time, and as we read Nehemiah's story, we read about his heart and his journey, here in Ezra we have a bigger picture and we're seeing uh, the numbers of the people who returned at this time. And the first thing I really want us to notice is the small number of people. It might seem like quite a lot, 42,000 and a few hundred, and then all the others, which adds up to roughly 50,000 people returning. That seems like a lot of people, except, except, you know, when David did that head count, the one that got him in trouble with God, there were over a million people that could wield a sword. When other counts of the household are taken in uh, in the book of Numbers, there's 800,000 mentioned, and other places where several hundred thousand people are mentioned. Hundreds of thousands of people were Israel, and this is before the exile, and now coming out of exile, going back in to take the land, some 50,000 people. And I'm not making any predictions about huge drops of numbers coming back, but just the point I want to make is that there is a difference. The group that come back are different from the group that left. And the group that left have uh, now entered into a whole new way of life. I mean, that generation is dead and gone, and the, the descendants are there, and here they are 
they are going to go back and take the land and rebuild it because it, it's it's what God gave to them and it's what there's their destiny. It's what they feel they should be doing. They know that in the land is the place where they communicate with God, where they're known by him. And so their desire is to get back to the land. But many people uh, will have created a whole new life and a different life and a life perhaps that now is trying to find God in ways that they weren't supposed to. Uh, perhaps it's ignoring God altogether. Um, perhaps they've got comfortable with a provisional kind of life, separated from the ways that they've accessed God as a people in the past. But they're a different group of people. And as we all return, we may well find that we're a different group of people. Yes, we may be smaller, we may be bigger. There'll be some surprises of people who are returning with us, as well as surprises of people who are not. But it won't be the same. And uh, we don't ever want to be people who get into a numbers game. We certainly don't want to be doing that. But here what we see is this, this little description of the people from different walks of life, from the priests as well as others who've come, but they're a different group and they're a different number. The task remains the same. They are to rebuild, they're to get on with the work of God, they're to do the stuff. There's just fewer of them doing it, but the task remains the same. And the task for us will remain the same. Whatever going back will look like, the task remains the same. The, the things that God has called us to do, uh, to worship him, to serve him, to serve other people, to do the things that make for his kingdom to come here on earth. We're to get on and do that, whatever number of us there are that return. And so the number may be different, but the task remains the same. There is still a great task for us to be getting on with, and it needs all of us to play our part, all of us, to play our role. The second thing I want us to see in this list is uh, two groups of people there who were keen to come back, keen to be part of that group who returned to Israel, but who couldn't quite prove who they were. And so some of them couldn't prove that they were descendants uh, of priests or just descendants of Israel, but they were so keen that they'd want to be there. Isn't that an amazing picture? There may well be some returning with us who we're not sure of where they've come from. Where on earth did you appear from? You weren't with us before. And, and there'd be a temptation in that, wouldn't there, to hold people at an arm's length, to make them different, to, uh, I don't know, for the people of Israel here, there may well have been a temptation for them to say, no, you can't come and rebuild. And yet they were included and they were brought in and they were part of that company of people who began the rebuilding. And even those who, who claimed that they were priests, who, who were part of the priestly line, well, they were held off from serving for a while, but only until one of the priests could come with the Urim and Thummim, which were about the way that they discerned the will and the, wine, that the, will and the mind of God, uh, that they could discern that these people were priests, in which case they were going to be free to serve again. Isn't that incredible? And so there's got to be something about our return, which is we are welcoming to new people who are joining us on this journey. So we're different because we're a different shape from the people before lockdown and people before this kind of exile, liminal, marginal experience. But there may well be people who are now part of us who weren't before. And it's a good question for us. How will we make sure that the new people who connected with us in this season remain a part of who we are? And there might surprise us. We might not discover them until we open the doors for the first time. And they may well come in and say, actually, I've been joining you week after week online or I've been joining you in some other way, keying into things from the past, listening to past sermons, and I'm glad you're back because I want to be part of this. How are we going to make sure that we are warm and receptive and welcome to the new people who come? Good question for us. So we're going to be surprised perhaps by numbers, who's there and who's not, and it'll be just the, the key point there is that it'll be different, and we're different people, and then there may well be some new people there that we have to make space for because God's been at work in their lives. And so the picture is not the same as the one that we left. If we think we're going back to the same, then we're going to be mistaken, aren't we? That it just can't be. So it'll be different. So new people as well as some people who we don't see uh, anymore. I want us to realise next what it was these people felt they were called to do. And Cyrus had been clear it was to go and rebuild the temple and to start rebuilding Israel. And so these are the people that had gone back to do precisely that. And in order to do that, in order to make sure that everything God has destined for them to do, 
Uh, it's interesting it says some of the heads of the families, not all. I mean, some people I've read in commentaries talk about this sort of 50,000 or the 42,000 with the extras, the 50,000, as being of one heart and mind who were those who'd heard the vision, heard God and were going back to do the stuff. I think when we see that it was only some of the heads of the families that gave, we realise that perhaps that isn't true. But still, the heads of the families gave money so that the temple could be rebuilt. And what a lot of money! about 500 kilos, I think, of uh, gold, huge amount of gold, and then uh, an awful lot of silver and 100 priestly garments. So it's huge amounts. We think 5,000 minas is about three tons, something like that. So huge amounts of gold and silver given so that the work could be done and so that the temple could be rebuilt. Here's the thing. When we come back into church and when all of us start returning to life as normal, it's up for us, those of us who are part of what God is doing now, to think about what it takes to resource all that needs to happen now. Um, this is not some big appeal for cash. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is uh, we all need to be very realistic about what it's going to take for all that God wants to happen to happen again for the rebuilding, for things to get up and running again, for um, the influence in evangelism, in community development, in uh, influence around our neighbours, the, the, the ministries and the life of our church, because we'll be different from when we went in. Some things will carry on, some things won't carry on, but everything that we do is going to need resourcing. And who's it going to be? It's down to us. It's for us to do that. And we have to ask some really good questions. Are we paying for the right things? Are we are the things that we're doing with our money together right now the right things that we should be doing? Good questions for us to be asking. And if there is some change uh, in, in the numbers of people and the surprising, then it's for us to just pause and seek the Lord's face and say, Lord, is my giving at the right level? Am, am I doing what I should be doing? Have I been neglectful in some of this? You know, these heads of some of the families gave very generously, but clearly some heads of families gave nothing at all. And yet God had called all of them to go and be part of the rebuilding. Again, I'm not doing a big heavy give us your money thing. I'm not doing that. What I am saying is part of our Christian discipleship and part of our following of God means each of us have to make sure that we're handling our finances in a way that honours and pleases God. So as we are heading back into uh, church and starting to rebuild things and starting to uh, get things off the ground again it's a really really good moment for us to take a kind of personal inventory are we those who are wanting to be part of that number going back and getting things going again we want to be counted in that are we sticking close to God and keeping up our commitments are we those who are going to be welcoming others to work alongside us in that and are we those who have got the right level of commitment in terms of our time our finances our prayer all of those key things that God has given and entrusted to us are we using them all wisely for the building of his kingdom it's a really good moment for us to take stock and say God what is it you wanted me to learn in exile and there'll be all kinds of lessons that God has for us as church, all sorts of lessons for us as a nation, but also for us as individuals. Again, I do not believe for a moment that God sent this pandemic, but I think he will use it to help shape us and to disciple us and to make us more like his son, Jesus. Um, and part of that is right now an opportunity for us to say, well, Lord, how am I doing? Let me just take a, a moment to have a look at myself and my own spiritual disciplines, my prayer, my worship, and yes, my giving and my involvement in ministry and my involvement with family and friends and am I seizing the moments that you've given to me? Have I got the right work-life balance as I re-enter into this new way of doing things and re-enter into church life once more? Am I in the place you want me to be, God? Am I ready for everything you have now? The temptation just to rush back and do all that we were doing before is so high, isn't it? But this is a moment we should pause before just picking up where we were before because we can't. We're not going back to that place. We're in this place now and here we must pause and say, Lord, Am I doing the right things? Am I in the right place? Am I using all that you've given to me in the way that you want me to use it so that your kingdom is being built right now in the ways that you want to build right now? Good prayer, huh? And then once these people had done that, they then settled 
and they were able to go back to their towns and to do their stuff. And I think there's an interesting thing here about the priority. The priority of the people was first, give so that God's work gets going. And then secondly, get on and rebuild life. And uh, uh, that's a key one for all of us to get right, me included. For all of us, we have to say, am I prioritizing in the right place? We know as we read the story, as uh, we read the whole story of what happened with the rebuilding, there were some issues that come up later about them concentrating too much on their homes while the Lord's uh, temple lies in ruins. But here we have to ask the question, am I getting the balance right? Am I getting my priorities right? And uh, am I really doing the things that God has called me to do? Everything that God has called us to do is important. He's called us to be family. He's called us to care for families. He's called us to work. He's called us to serve. He's called us to be a part of what he's doing in our life together. And so we don't want to neglect any of that. We really don't. But we want to be the people who get it right. So what has God called you to do first? Do that and do it wholeheartedly and then get on with the rest of life and do that wholeheartedly. Uh, for me and my family, we've had a reminder over this last year following some bereavements that life is incredibly short. It's incredibly short. So prioritize in your life the things that God has called you to do. Make them the priority. Let everything else play second fiddle for a little while. Uh, if God's called you to, to be married to somebody, then be married to them wholeheartedly. If God has called you to be a parent, be a parent wholeheartedly. What has he called you to in life? Where he's called you to serve, what he's equipped you to do. Do those things wholeheartedly. Do them absolutely, completely wholeheartedly because you have this one life. So invest it well in the things that God has called you to do and the things that you enjoy doing. Do it, do it wholeheartedly and let everything else follow after. And here the people were called, go, go back and rebuild. Start with the temple, then go back and rebuild your towns. And that's what they did. So there's a lesson for us to learn. It's a real who's who this list, who's there and who isn't. There's a who isn't that I haven't mentioned yet. And uh, perhaps as you have read this passage, you've wondered, well, where's the king? <laughs> Before exile, there were kings. And now we're in this season and there are no kings. Um, David promised, sorry, David received a promise from God. That there would always be one of his children on the throne. A promise that when we read God's conversation with Solomon becomes a little more qualified. And the issue there is, will they continue to follow the one true God? And as they continue to follow the one true God, then yes, David's descendants will reign. But if not, then no. And exile is a very powerful image of that no, isn't it? But in that list of people coming back is one, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel who is there in the line of David and Zerubbabel who appears in the genealogies in Luke for Jesus and in Matthew's genealogy as well for Jesus. One of Jesus' descendants appears here. So the royal line is there, but the royal line is not pressing to take its place on the throne. Interesting. Zerubbabel isn't there with a crown on his head saying, and I'm going to be king. Zerubbabel is there, even though he has a royal family, alongside the others to serve and to lead, yes, but in the company of others and to see God's work gets done. When we come back, perhaps it's a time for all of us to ask questions about the things that we're doing. Maybe God is going to call some of us out of leadership and some of us into leadership. Maybe there's things that you will need to step aside from for somebody else. And maybe there are things that God is saying to you, you know, it's really time you entered in to leading in this area. As he has given us so much, we want to serve him wholeheartedly and with humility, which means we mustn't be those who cling on to position or prestige. If it is time that God is saying, step aside, step aside for a season or step aside completely. Uh, or if God is saying to us, you know, don't have the false humility that says I can't do it and I can't serve because it's all about him and not about us. And so in this who's who, we might have expected to see all of the rulers and all of the positions and the titles, and yet we don't. The one that could claim it is just listed alongside others. And even though he's going to appear in the genealogies of, the genealogies of Jesus, right now he is not clinging to a throne. Let us not cling to power. Let us not cling to what was before. But let's cling on to God and let's hold on to him as he rebuilds among us. Let's hold everything that he's given to us lightly before him so that as we return to whatever the new normal will be, his kingdom can be our priority. His work can get done as we work together and we will see our nation transformed as God's transformed people play the roles that he's called us all to do.
Let's pray. Father, we come to you and ask that your blessing will be upon us in this season of new beginnings. Help us to learn and to serve and to grow together. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we draw to a close, uh, I want to use the blessing from Numbers chapter 6. And just to remind you again, next week we'll be sharing communion together. And whether you're with us in the building or at home, uh, if you're at home, you'll need to provide uh, the elements that you need for that. But uh, we'll be sharing communion next week. And from the end of Numbers chapter 6, we read these words. Words that God asked the priests to put like put these words onto his people, put his blessing on people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Do join us for coffee and you'll find the details of that on our Facebook page, Zoom. We're happening in just a few minutes at the end of this broadcast. Uh, so please do join us for coffee then. God bless you.